So it's been some time. Verse by verse, we're now in chapter 16 once again, looking at verses 6 through 15. So um, if you'd like to follow along in your Bible, so also in the Pew Bible, it's page 483, the text we'll be looking at. So Luke chapter 16, beginning of verse 6. And so as you may have noticed so far in this book, um, it is the book of Acts is essentially the uh, story of the origins and growth of the New Testament church, how we got here uh, to this point. So the reason why we're even here today in uh, this church on Long Island, New York, is because what, ha- what God has done through, throughout the centuries in building his church. So at this point in the story of Acts, Uh, The first missionary journey by the Apostle Paul has been completed. The second one uh, has now begun. Uh, This time around, if you recall, he brings a young man named Timothy along with Silas and Luke. And all of these men were dedicated to the spread of the gospel to unreached pagan and Jewish people. And as you recall uh, from last time in verses 1 through 5 of chapter 16, we read about how Timothy, as a grown man, underwent circumcision just so that he could minister with Paul to to the Jews. So uh, undergoing that Old Covenant surgical procedure, you could say, um, which had, as we covered, no bearing on his salvation whatsoever, allowed him to go into the synagogues and preach with the Apostle Paul to preach the gospel to them. Otherwise, he would have never been able to go. So um, as as you know, it was their custom went on these missionary journeys to go to the synagogues first and preach Christ to the Jews. And so had Timothy remained uncircumcised, they would have not let him in because they knew his father was a Greek and that he probably did not have that, that, that procedure done. And so that's what he did. He was willing to do that, to sacrifice that for the sake of the kingdom of God. Um, so what Timothy did serves as an example to us that if we want to see people saved, if we want to see the kingdom grow, We have to be willing to make sacrifices and inconvenience ourselves in order to do that. And today's text, verses 6 to 15, explains how the gospel first came to the European continent, particularly through the region of Macedonia. Uh, Let's begin reading uh, verses 6 to 10. It says, And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. When they had come up to Mesia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, passing by Mesia, they went down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I'm sure you all know where all those towns are, right? Off the top of your head. You've been studying Phrygia and um, Galatia and Mesia, right? Um, So Paul and Silas and Timothy, uh, Luke, they make plans to go to those places. And those are all in Asia Minor, what we would called present-day Turkey. Uh, but, but strangely, God forbids them to do so. So first, it, it says they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. That would be Turkey again. And then it says the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. In my translation, did not allow them to go to Bithynia. So why does he use the term Holy Spirit and then later Spirit of Jesus? Well, I think the main point is God made it clear to them that they should not go where they planned on going. So it is possible the Holy Spirit forbidding them to preach the word in Asia may have been through the mouth of a prophet. So a prophet during the times of the early church would have a direct word from the Holy Spirit. So during the beginning phases of the church, God would speak through people, right? They, they would have a prophetic word directly from God. Today, I don't believe that happens anymore because there's no more office of prophet, there's no more prophets, and we have the completed uh, canon of scripture. 
However, I do think that the Holy Spirit can and does prompt his children to say things or do things, lead them to do that, but I don't think people have the gift of prophecy anymore like it existed in the time of the apostles. So it's quite possible someone had a prophetic word to um, Paul from God while they're in Phrygia and Galatia. Now, what about the spirit of Jesus? Um, that's what my translation says, spirit of Jesus. There, there doesn't seem to be much of a difference between the two usages of Holy Spirit and spirit of Jesus. Maybe this was a um, direct revelation to Paul from Jesus himself, who is now ascended into heaven, or maybe it's just another way of saying the Holy Spirit. The main point is still the same. God prevented them from going to those places. And the question is why? Why would God prevent them from going to a place that needed to hear the gospel? When God says no to our plans, we tend to think that he says no because it's bad, right? We're wanting something bad and God says no. Was this a bad thing that Paul and the others were attempting to do? Of course not. It was a good thing. They were well-intentioned. They were going to go preach the gospel to the Jews and Gentiles and people who never heard of it, or maybe perhaps to some who already rejected it and they needed to hear it again. But the Holy Spirit prevented them from carrying out their plans, which were actually good, commendable things. And the reason why God said no to them was he obviously had other plans for them. And that's an important lesson for us to learn through this. Um, this is something that Christians experience, I think, pretty regularly. We make plans to do things all the time, good things. We might uh, have plans to do things for God. And we even pray about things, and God says no, and he closes doors that we just assumed he would open for us. And the bottom line is we really can't fathom the depth of God's wisdom and sovereignty. God is orchestrating all things in the entire universe and has his plans for everything and for every person. The Bible says that God is working all things according to the counsel of his will. So we may have plans or desires for something, um, things which may be good, but God says no because he's got something else in mind. One passage of scripture that I find fascinating um, because it gives us kind of a, a glimpse into the providential mind of God is found in Genesis chapter 16 and where God is telling Abraham that his descendants are going to be enslaved for 400 years in a foreign land. Um, and that was obviously Egypt, which would later become the Exodus where they were brought out of captivity. And you may think, why would he keep them there for so long? And God told Abraham the reason. He said that they shall come back here, your people, to the promised land in the fourth generation for or because the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Which is a, kind of a strange thing to our ears to, to hear, probably to Abraham as well. So God was timing things so that the wickedness of the Amorites, which would need to be punished by God, would coincide with the taking over of the promised land, which would mean defeating the Amorites in battle. So he was being, letting the Amorites grow in wickedness before he would um, kind of wipe them out. Um, so, in other words, God says no for a long time to things, or God allows things to happen a certain way and closes certain doors because he's planning things that we can't comprehend. And the things we want to do would potentially conflict with what God is planning, and so he says no to things. And that's essentially what happened here with Paul and the others on this missionary journey. They want to go to Asia Minor. God says no. Why? Because he wants them, as we'll see, to go to Macedonia. That was his plan. If you look at verses um, 8 to 10, again, it says, So passing by Mesia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. I don't know if you caught something that I just read, uh, but for the entirety of the book of Acts, except in chapter 1's introduction, everything's written in the third person. So for the first time since then, it's now in the first person. 
first person plural, if I'm getting my grammar right. right? Um, this tells us that Luke, the author of Acts, is now part of the story. Um, if you notice, he says, we. Um, so it's Paul, Silas, Luke, and Timothy on this journey being led by God. Um, verse 10 says, we sought to go to Macedonia. So he's got, Paul has this vision at night, and there's a Macedonian man urging them to come over to Macedonia and help us. Uh, this is the, the Macedonian call. Uh, in this vision, the man asked for help. And obviously, this man is just representing the people of Macedonia. God just put this man there to represent them to go over there. Uh, what kind of help did he need? And the answer to that question really gets to the heart of what true missionary work should be like. Does this man, who represents the Macedonian people, need food or shelter? Did he need money or an education? Did he need physical healing or medical care? Certainly some of the people in Macedonia needed those things, but what did they need the most? Verse 10 tells us that this vision made it clear to them that God had called them to preach the gospel to the Macedonians. So the help that this man truly needed was far more urgent than any physical help. He needed spiritual help. The people of Macedonia needed to hear the gospel. That was the help they needed most. These were, by and large, pagan people worshiping Greek and Roman gods, living in utter spiritual darkness. And what they needed most of all was the light of the gospel. And this flies in the face of the modern social gospel uh, that has infiltrated the churches probably over the last hundred years or so. And you have so many um, so-called mission trips today, or even missionaries, people take that label, um, and they're, entire, they're, they're centered entirely around relieving physical needs of people, which of course is good, and it's wrong if we don't help people right, physically. But what happens is then they totally ignore the greater need of people, which is the spiritual needs of people, salvation. There's countless short-term mission trips. They call them that. Um, that people, especially younger people, will go on that involve helping with physical needs, right? Good. But there's little to no evangelism that, that takes place. Certainly there are exceptions. Um, but from what I know and I have experienced myself, this is normally how it goes. You go there, you might go somewhere and like build a house for someone. That's, that's great. Um, but that's not a mission trip. Uh, that's really just a humanitarian aid trip. Uh, and any secular organization like the Red Cross can do that. Mission trips should focus on spiritual need needs first and any missionary, full-time missionary as well. And then physical needs second. Ideally both would be involved, right? We don't want to neglect people's physical needs, obviously. That would mean we don't love them either. Charles Spurgeon said, the best help Paul could render to the Macedonians was to preach the gospel to them. The best help we can give men socially is to help them religiously, and the best religious help is to preach the gospel to them. Amen. So the primary goal of this missionary endeavor into Europe was to bring the gospel there so that people can be saved, that they can believe in Christ. So the other thing this vision Paul had about the Macedonian man uh, shows us is that mankind is in need of help in general, spiritual help, the saving of the soul. This great need was not something limited to Macedonia in the first century. This is a need of all people on the whole earth. People need spiritual help. They need salvation. If this were not true, there would be no need for Paul and the apostles to go on these missionary journeys and to risk their lives and eventually give their lives for the sake of the salvation of souls. Mankind is in need of saving because all of mankind are sinners and have uh, sinned against a holy God. I had a very interesting conversation with a woman just the other day, and she said something to me I had never heard any non-Christian say in my entire life. Not that she's the only one to say this, but she's the only non-Christian I've ever heard say this. So this woman was uh, retired, and she volunteered her time for uh, this 
nonprofit called the Innocence Project. You may have heard of it. Um, and that this um, nonprofit works on, it's like a team of lawyers and stuff, and they work on getting innocent people out of jail, men and women. Um, and it's, I think she told me, statistically, two to four percent of the entire prison population is, are, are innocent people. And I think it works out to be about 20,000 plus people behind bars innocently. It's a horrible thing. Um, and this organization has freed people who were wrongfully in prison, sometimes for decades. Um, and they do this using more modern DNA evidence and things like that, which didn't exist 25, 30 years ago. And some of these people are incarcerated uh, from corrupt police officers, district attorneys, judges, um, or even sometimes an eyewitness gave wrong information about a, a defendant and it landed him or her in jail for many years sometimes. And she was telling me about a particular police officer, named, I don't remember, but I think I remember reading about him. And he was responsible for planning evidence and arresting, I think, dozens of, of young men. And he eventually, he himself got caught and, and went to jail himself, right? And we know this is, these are rare exceptions. Most police officers are, are good and do, do a good work. Um, and, you know, but this, this guy was really bad, should not have been a police officer, and was uh, willfully imprisoning, uh, getting people convicted, planting evidence and things. And I said to her, I don't know how some people could sleep at night doing that, because they'll do these things just to get a promotion. They know they're putting these guys away uh, for years, and they don't care. And they're like, yeah, I get a promotion, or I can get reelected. I said, how do these people sleep at night? Because all people have a conscience, right? And she said to me, you know, for my entire life, I always thought people were basically good until I started doing this. And she said something like, you know, since you're a pastor, I understand you too may think people are basically good. And I politely interjected and told her, I believe all people are that evil and sinful and in need of grace. Like that is our kind of, that's where mankind is naturally. But that's the first time I ever heard a person that doesn't have a Christian worldview admit that people are not basically good. Most people think humans are, are basically good. You have some exceptions of, of bad people, right? So... She saw that ordinary people are capable of doing very evil things. You know, the local police officer or district attorney or judge is like throwing people in jail and, and doesn't care. Like that could be your, your next door neighbor, looks like a regular guy, doing evil things. Ordinary people are capable of doing that. And that's actually a biblical perspective on the reality of human beings, that we're all by nature sinners and every single one of us is capable of doing horrible things, even the most heinous things. And you may think, well, not me. I could never do that. I could never you know, throw someone in jail and not care about it. I could never kill anyone or you name it, all the things you say you could never do. But you have to admit, if you're honest, that the potential is there because what if you grew up in a different environment? What if you grew up not being taught right from wrong? Or you grew up with evil parents or whatever? You could easily have become a monster, right? The potential is in you. It's in every single one of us. And the reality is we have sinned in more ways than we can ever imagine if we compare ourselves to the Word of God, if we compare ourselves to the Lord Jesus. Yes, there are certain evils you would never do. Me too. But if you compare yourself to God's law, you've already done a lot, a lot of evil against God. Maybe you may think not so much against people physically, but we've all sinned against God in more ways than we can count. Because the Bible is clear that mankind is not good by nature. Yes, we're capable of doing good things because we're image bearers of God, right? As we heard last week, and Adolf Hitler loved his dogs and Ava Brown, right? But we're all capable of doing good things because we're made in his image, but we're not inherently good. That's not our nature. We have to compare our hearts, our actions to the law of God. And, you know, you can compare yourself to the Ten Commandments. You'll see quickly you violated all of them in some way, shape, or form. Not just in our actions, but even our thoughts, right? So, you know, if, you could, if we could pull down this screen and put every evil thought you've ever had on the screen, we'd all run for the hills, right? Um, and we think God doesn't see our thoughts. He does. You think the Creator is limited to know 
uh, about his creation. Right? We're all bad, we're all sinful, and that's why we need Christ. That is why Christ came to die. So the bad news is we're all, we're all bad. The good news is Christ came to die in our place. So what happened to Jesus on the cross was the punishment that we deserve for our sin. We call that penal substitution. That he died in our place. Jesus bore God's wrath upon himself. That was the wrath we deserve for our sin. And then he rose again three days later for our justification. So all mankind needs help, needs saving. The only way to truly be helped is to repent, to turn from sin, believe the gospel, believe that Jesus died in the place of sinners, and he rose from the dead. So the Macedonian man in the vision said he needed help, and their conclusion, these Christian men concluded, God has called us to preach the gospel. That was the logical conclusion to them. Uh, that was the help that the Macedonians needed, so they went. And that is the help all mankind still needs the most today. And so we go as Christians, as Jesus commanded us, and we go and partake in the Great Commission. Now let's move down to verses 11 through 15. So, setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. All right, so Luke seems to be kind of in a rush here as he describes the geographic locations. Uh, again, it makes our head spin. We have no idea unless we're looking at a map. If, you look, if your Bible has one in the back, you can just kind of see where they're going. Um, so they go f uh, from Troas, again, Turkey, Asia Minor. That's right on the a Aegean Sea. They make it to Philippi. Later, the book of Philippians would be written to them. Philippi is in Macedonia, which would be Greece. Uh, at this point in history, Macedonia is a Roman colony um, since the Roman Empire took over, over Greece, right? There's no more Greek Empire. is long gone. So it's a Roman colony, and they stay there in Philippi for several days, and then, the Saturday, and then Saturday, the Sabbath, approaches. Again, what did Paul and the others customarily do on the Sabbath, on their journeys? They go to the local Jewish synagogue, and they preach Christ to the Jews. The problem was here, there was no synagogue. Apparently, there was not much in terms of a Jewish population in Macedonia. Instead, there was a place of prayer. So if you were a Jewish expat, as we would say, you left Israel, and you moved to you know, Asia Minor or Greece or something, and, uh, which would be a pagan land, and you wanted to worship in a synagogue and worship uh, Jehovah God, Yahweh, you had to start a synagogue. But according to Jewish law, you needed to have a minimum of 10 men to do so. If there was not enough men to do that, then you would start a place of prayer, I guess praying that one of the things you would pray for was that God would send people, 10 men, to start a synagogue. And this prayer meeting would typically be established outside, outdoors, preferably by water. Why it was preferable by water, I'm not sure, but that's just what I read, um, and that's where these people were. So Paul, Luke, Timothy, Silas, they expected this. They go outside to the gate to the riverside where they says they supposed there was a place of prayer. So they, they knew if there are any Jews or God-fearing Gentiles, they should be gathered outside the city near the river, and sure enough, uh, that's where they were. Um, so apparently there was only women there, uh, which would explain why there's no synagogue in that area. So Paul and his men sit down and they speak to the women gathered there. One of these women who's at the center of the story is a woman <clears throat> named Lydia. Look at verse 14. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. 
the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. So Luke tells us a few things about Lydia. One, she's from a, a city called Thyatira, which is a couple hundred miles away in Asia Minor, Turkey. So she was not native to Macedonia, and she was probably there for business reasons. Uh, secondly, along those lines, she was a seller of purple goods. Um, that was her profession. Today, purple is not a big deal, doesn't mean much. The first thing that I think about when I hear purple is unfortunately Barney. That's the only thing that comes to mind. Um, some people can wear purple and pull it off. Other people cannot wear purple. It's one of those colors that's kind of like love it or hate it. Um, I just think of a big purple dinosaur, and that's probably how it'll always be. Uh, but in ancient times, purple was synonymous with royalty. So anything dyed purple was expensive. And the reason why was because purple dye was very expensive to make in those times. Purple dye was extracted from certain mollusks, um, you know, shelled creatures, seashells, uh, these like, uh, you know, like snail type creatures, like the big shells you find on the ocean and, and on the beach, maybe in like the south or whatever. But um, so they came from mollusks. It was a quite a process to make it. So apparently Lydia's in the region having something to do with that. And maybe she was making the dye and going to bring it back home. Maybe she was going to purchase the dye and bring it back home. Not sure what she's doing there. Likely something for her business. Um, and I, I, they actually recently found some, um, in Israel, purple, purple dyed wool from around 1000 BC. And the color was still very vibrant. So it was, it was a very effective material they used. Uh, thirdly, it says she was a worshiper of God. What does that mean? Uh, it means she was likely a Gentile who converted to Judaism. Um, she would be what they called a God-fearer, a Gentile who renounced the pagan uh, religion of her upbringing and was a worshiper of Yahweh, where she would try to keep the Old Testament commandments and live as faithfully as she could as a Gentile. Uh, and while she worshiped God, she didn't know about Christ the Messiah. So worshiping God is not enough, right? You, you must worship him, the Bible says, in spirit and truth. You can only worship God through faith in Christ. That, that's really the, kind of a brief bio of this woman named Lydia. So there was something there. She was searching after God, worshiping God. She needed to hear about the Messiah. And um, really the most important thing that's said about her is that it says the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And then, well, what's so special about that? The fact that the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to Paul tells us a lot about the nature, again, of mankind and about God. This coincides uh, with what I said earlier about mankind needing help, needing salvation, right? We all desperately need salvation. The problem is, on our own, we don't think we need help. And, you know, we think we're, we're good enough to, to please God. And on our own, we're actually unable to help ourselves. I believe the Bible teaches that we're so depraved and enslaved by sin and love our sins so much that we're actually incapable of believing the gospel on our own in a, in a saving way. And I think this verse is one of those proof texts along with many others. What is it, according to Acts 16, 14, that caused Lydia to be saved? It, it's the fact that the Lord opened her heart to believe what was said by Paul, which obviously was the gospel, right? The good news about Jesus. God opened her heart. Lydia did not open her own heart. God had to do it. Her heart was closed. He opened it. And if you're saved and you're trusting Christ today, it's because God opened your heart, not you. And you may think, but I heard the gospel and I believed it. Yes, but why? Why? The biblical explanation for why anyone believes in Christ is that God opened their heart. God prepared the soil of their heart to receive the word. You didn't just choose to believe it because you possess some inherent goodness or some wisdom that others do not. The only reason why you believe in Christ is because God opened your eyes and your heart to receive him. And this takes away all the glory from man and gives it to God. Because if salvation is really as simple as I made the right choice 
then you get all the glory and God gets nothing but a thanks for the offer. So if you're a Christian, take a look at your life. Take a look at the grace that God has shown you. And now think about someone else you know who doesn't know Christ. Maybe it's a friend or family member. What's the difference between you and them? Is it simply you made uh, the right choice, you took the right path, and they didn't? I don't see that in the Bible. I think it's a very shallow way of looking at it. Biblically speaking, the only reason why you may be saved and someone else is not because um, you made the right choice, but because God opened your heart to believe. You did make a better choice than someone else, perhaps, but only because God made that possible by his grace alone. I don't think there's any way around this, as much as we all want to believe that all people are given this uh, e equal opportunity, ability to, to choose Christ, and salvation only depends upon how wise of a decision we make. It's just not in the Bible, I don't think. I see in the scriptures that God has to open our hearts in order to pay attention in a, in a saving way, pay attention to the message of the gospel and receive it by faith. And that's exactly what happened here to Lydia. God was gracious to her and opened her heart, not only her, but to her household as well. Because it says in verse 15, after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. In other words, she, she won us over. They, they went. So the evidence of God's grace upon her was found in the fact that Paul and the others baptized her and her family. And she wanted more teaching. She was hospitable to them. She wanted to be discipled. She wanted to grow. She wanted to learn from them. Paul would not have baptized Lydia or her family if he had no evidence of regeneration in their lives. We're seeing this pattern again as we saw earlier that when people believed the gospel, they were baptized. Some would take this text to say that this proves infant baptism. It says her whole household was baptized, which I think is a stretch because I don't think that's consistent with the rest of Scripture and it doesn't say anything about babies here. Um, but we see patterns throughout the Bible, right? The gospel is preached, people believe, right? There's evidence of it, and then they're baptized. So baptism, I believe, is an, that the Bible teaches an outward expression of an inward grace, right? It's a representation of being buried and then resurrected with Christ, um, dead to sin, alive in Christ. It's a public demonstration, a proclamation of what God has done in your life. Uh, a demonstration that God has opened your heart to receive Christ. And so Lydia is the first recorded convert to Christianity on the European continent. Right? And this was all orchestrated by the hand of God. What at first may have seemed like a disappointing answer in God closing doors turned out to be the way in which God um, would bring salvation to a people who were in desperate need of saving grace. I just want to close with a few points of application, just kind of recap, take away three things that we can bring home with us. Number one, don't be discouraged when God closes doors. Don't be discouraged when God says no to your prayers. He has plans that are oftentimes different than yours and mine. Remember that verse in Isaiah 55? God said, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. When we remember that, that will keep us from being discouraged when God says no. Secondly, look at people, view people as if they are the Macedonian man in Paul's vision. Right? We're, we're surrounded by people who are in desperate need of help. Most don't even know it. And the greatest need they have is Christ, is salvation. Uh, you may not be able to meet much of their physical needs. We do as much as we can. But you can meet their greatest need, which is spiritual need, salvation. And the gospel is the only thing that can meet that need. So look at other people as they are, as, as Paul saw this Macedonian man. Thirdly, and finally, pray that God would open hearts 
so people can listen and believe the message of the gospel that we speak to them. Without that, nothing's going to happen. No one's going to be saved. All you and I can do now is sow the seeds, and, but God can actually open their hearts to receive it. So we preach the gospel we, and we pray that God would plant that seed deep into their heart and water it just like he did here to Lydia and her family. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you for uh, this missionary journey and the, the ones that come after it and before it that were responsible for bringing the gospel to the Western world and eventually the rest of the, the globe. Lord, and here we are now um, able to worship you and we have salvation because of uh, so many of uh, men and women who dedicated their lives sacrificially to spreading the good news. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would open all of our hearts to receive the truth of the word that we, we heard today. It's nothing that I said, but it's all your word and your Holy Spirit that uh, draws men to yourself. We pray that that would be true, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May the grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. God bless you. You're all dismissed. Okay, amen.